So today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be learning how to use a microscope. So before we get started, let's go over some basic information about microscopes. All scopes are going to have an arm and a base, and this is how we're going to carry the microscope. So you pick it up with both hands by the arm and the base. They're very expensive. We want to make sure that we don't drop them and damage them. Microscopes have a piece here called the eyepiece, and eyepieces have lenses in them. And the lens is going to magnify something to be bigger than it normally is. So all of the microscopes that we have in this school have an eyepiece with a lens that can magnify something to be 10 times larger than it normally is. In addition to the lens and the eyepiece, we also have lenses on these objectives that you can see me spinning here. And the objectives have different lenses of different powers. The smallest objective that we have has a lens that magnifies something to be four times larger than it normally is. Our next objective has a power of 10, which means it magnifies something to be 10 times larger than it normally is. And our strongest objective on this microscope has a power of 43. So that means it's going to magnify something to be 43 times larger than it normally is. However, we need to keep in mind that we also had a lens here in the eyepiece. So if we're trying to calculate the total power of magnification, then we need to take the power of the eyepiece. In our case, those are 10. And we need to multiply this by the power of the objective. So if we are looking at the smallest objective, which is worth four, then we would have a total magnification of 40. If we have an eyepiece that has a power of 10 and our objective has a power of 10 also, then we would have a total magnification of 100. So something would be 100 times larger than it normally is. If we have a power in the eyepiece of 10 and we are using an objective that has 43 times the magnification of a, a normal organism, we would have a total power of 430 total magnification. And so that means that our maximum power of magnification is gonna magnify something to be 430 times larger than it's normally going to be. When the microscope is plugged in, you have a light source here and there's a switch to turn the light source on and off. So when we need to focus on something, we're going to make sure that we have this lowest objective and it is as far away from the stage as possible. So this is the stage. This is where you're going to put your specimen. We have stage clips which will hold that um, slide down and make sure that it doesn't move too fast when you're trying to manipulate it. So once we have our specimen under the microscope, we're gonna have our lowest objective set and we're gonna use these two knobs. The big knob is your course focus and it's big and gray and you're gonna notice that it'll actually move the objectives up and down. We have another knob, which is this little silver one and this is the fine focus. And this is gonna move around the lens in the eyepiece so that we can get um, our specimen focused. So in order to focus a microscope, you're gonna start with the lowest power. The objective is far away from the stage. You look into the microscope and you use the course knob to lower this um, objective toward the stage until you see detail. And once you have your specimen focused, then you're gonna center the specimen in your field of vision that you can see. Once it's centered, you're gonna switch your objective to the next highest power and we're going to look through the eyepiece and use this fine focus this silver knob to toggle the specimen back and forth until we're able to see detail there as well. Once you have your detail set on this power you're going to center your specimen in your field of vision and then we're going to switch over to the next highest power. And once you're in high power, you wanna make sure that you're only using the fine focus knob. Um, anything else is gonna move this objective too quickly for you to be able to focus it. And in certain microscopes, you could also damage the lens in the microscope because this course knob can move the entire objective and you might end up breaking the slide. So on high power, make sure that you're only using the fine focus and we'll toggle that back and forth to be able to see uh, detail in high power and also to see different layers of that specimen. We're going to be looking at several different types of cells today and all of these cells are going to require us to make a wet mount slide. So a slide is a larger piece of um, 
glass or plastic that we're going to use to view an organism. And we also have cover slips and these are tiny little pieces that we put over the specimen in order to protect the specimen and the microscope from touching one another. So in order to make a wet mount slide, first we're going to place a drop of liquid on the slide. Just like so, we want to try not to get any air bubbles in that liquid. The next step is we're going to place the specimen on the slide in the liquid. So I'm going to take a piece of onion and I'm going to pull off a single layer of cells from this onion by just peeling back that layer on the inside. So hopefully you can see that there on my finger. This is just a single layer of onion cells. And I'm going to put this in my liquid and try to make sure it goes in there as flat as possible. All right. Once I have my specimen in the liquid on the slide, I'm going to put my cover slip on and I'm going to lay this cover slip on at an angle, trying to push out all of the air bubbles that might be under this um, cover slip. So here you can see my slide. Here's my cover slip. Just going to drop that on and try to put it at an angle so that all of my air bubbles get squeezed out. The next thing I'm going to do is place the slide on the stage right here. Use my slide clips to prevent this from sliding around too quickly. And I'm going to focus this by starting on low power with the objective and the stage as far apart as I can get them. And as I look through this, I'm going to lower the objective toward the stage until I see detail. And once I see detail, I can switch to the next highest power and I can use my fine focus from there to try to get more and more detail all the way up to high power. There's also a little slider here um, on your microscope that will control how much light you're letting go through the slide and that you can use to increase the contrast of what you're looking at. So you saw me make an onion slide. That's the first kind of cell I'm gonna be looking at. We're also going to be looking at a green plant. And so I'm gonna make my wet mount slide by dropping a single drop of liquid on my slide. I'm going to take my green plant and I'm gonna pull off a single leaf. And we are using Elodea because it's only two cell layers thick. So it's uh, really easy to be able to get a good picture on the microscope with something that thin. So we put the LED leaf in the slide and I'm gonna take a cover slip and place it over my LED at an angle to try to squeeze out all of the air bubbles. And I'm also going to make a slide so that I can look at my cheek cells. And in order to do this, I'm gonna use a different kind of liquid, not just water. So I'm gonna use something called methylene blue. Methylene blue is going to dye the cheek cells blue so that they show up better under the microscope. It's really hard to see your cheek cells because they are so small and transparent under a microscope. Uh, so you can look right through them and never even see them. So the dye is gonna help us be able to see those um, cheek cells. And in order to get my cheek cells, I'm gonna take a toothpick and just swab the inside of my cheek. Now, you don't have to put a lot of pressure here. You do need to put some, but if you hurt yourself doing this, well, you're doing it wrong. So you just lightly scrape the inside of your mouth. And those cells are gonna come right off into the toothpick. And we're gonna take the side of the toothpick that we swabbed with and just roll it around in this methylene blue. And all of those cells are gonna come right off into that methylene blue. And I'm gonna take my toothpick and make sure that I throw it away because I don't wanna leave something with saliva laying around the classroom. Once I've thrown away my toothpick, I'm gonna take a cover slip and I'm gonna drop that over my methylene blue at an angle and try to squeeze out all of the air bubbles. And then I can put this slide on the stage and go through my focusing routine to see the cells in uh, low to high power. So I'm gonna go focus these microscopes on these cells. I'm gonna take a few pictures of them from low to medium to high power. And then we'll talk about these different kinds of cells that you're seeing. Now that we focused on these different plant and animal cells, let's talk about what we were able to see. 
So this is our onion on low power and we can see the matrix of cells. They're made up of these little blocks that look kind of like a brick wall. As we increase our power of magnification to 100 times, we're able to see in more detail and these cells are gonna be clearer. We're able to start seeing the nuclei in these cells. And as we go to 430 times magnification, we're able to see the nucleus very well. You can see the cell wall, the space between these cells, and you can see the cytoplasm, the inner goop that makes up the inside of a cell. And that's pretty much all that you're gonna be able to see in an onion cell. So this is our Elodea on low power on uh, 40 times magnification. As we increase to more detail at 100 times magnification, you can see that we still have the rectangular shape to these cells. And as we go to 430 times magnification, we can see even more detail. So we have the cell wall, which is the space that you're able to see between these rectangular cells. We have the cytoplasm, which is the inner goop um, of the cell where all the organelles are gonna float around in. And you can see these little green bubbles. And these little green bubbles are chloroplasts that are responsible for photosynthesis. Now we're really not able to see the nuclei of these cells because there are so many chloroplasts in them. Here you're able to see these chloroplasts moving around in the cytoplasm. This is called cytoplasmic streaming. And chloroplasts do this because they don't wanna to get too much light that would burn the chlorophyll up in them and they wouldn't be able to do their job anymore. So chloroplasts are able to move around inside of a cell in order to prevent getting too much light. If we look at our cheek cells on low power, they don't look like very much, but each one of these little blue dots is a cheek cell. If we increase the power, you can see a bit more detail. We're starting to see the nuclei in these cells. And if we increase to even more power, you're able to see in pretty good detail the nucleus, the plasma membrane. Animal cells do not have a cell wall, so there's no outer coating to these, um, which is why they have lots of different shapes and not just um, one type of shape. We can also see the cytoplasm inside of this cell. Let's think of some post-lab questions. So as we increase the power of magnification on the microscope, you see the specimen get bigger and you're able to see it in more detail. The organelles we were able to see in these organisms, in the onion, we were able to see the cell wall. Inside of the cell wall, we had the plasma membrane. We were able to see the cytoplasm and the nucleus. In the Elodea, which is also a plant cell, we are able to see that cell wall, the plasma membrane, which is inside of that cell wall, uh, the cytoplasm, but we can't see the nucleus. It is there, but it's being blocked by all of those little chloroplasts, those green bubbles that are doing photosynthesis. In the animal cell, we do not have a cell wall at all. We do have a nucleus and ha we have cytoplasm and we have a cell membrane, but again, that cell membrane is not enclosed inside of a cell wall. So why do you think the Elodea, a green plant, had chloroplasts, but the onion, which is also part of a plant, did not? Well, think about what chloroplasts do. They take in sunlight and process sunlight into carbohydrates during photosynthesis. So the green part of a plant, the leaves, are going to be exposed to the sun and therefore can do photosynthesis. But the onion leaves, which are specialized leaves, um, specialized to store starch in the plant, these leaves are not exposed to the sun. They are gonna be underground. And since they do not come in contact with sunlight, they're not gonna be doing any photosynthesis. Uh, so they do not need chloroplasts. Key differences we see between plant and animal cells. The plant cells, notice both of them had a cell wall, okay? Um, animals do not have a cell wall. In the plant cells, we were able to see chloroplasts with the Elodea. In the animal cell, we're never going to see those chloroplasts. There are some similarities between plant and animal cells as well. Like we said, all of them have a nucleus and all of them have cytoplasm and a plasma membrane. So far, we've looked at some slides that we've made ourselves using the wet mount process. And I did leave one thing off of this. Make sure that you dry the excess liquid off of the slide before you put it under the microscope. And that's to protect these lenses from water and chemicals like methylene blue that could damage the lens. So we have made wet mount slides of an onion, a green plant called Elodea, and then we use the methylene blue to dye our own cheek cells and look at those. But we can also look at preserved organisms, and we're going to look at a few of these today. The organisms we're looking at are protists, 
And protists are eukaryotic cells, which means they have a nucleus in them. Now there are four kingdoms of eukarya. You could have plants, animals, fungi, or protists. And protists are unique because they don't fit in with the other kingdoms of eukarya, but they may have some characteristics that they share between two or more of these kingdoms. So we're gonna be looking at some slides today called Euglena, and you can see when you have a preserved slide that the name is going to be written on the slide for you. We're going to be looking at Paramecium. So you can see where that's going to be written on the slide. And notice that you can't see anything under these slides yet. We are going to have to get them under the microscope because these are unicellular organisms. We're also going to be looking at amoeba. And so these are the three big protists that you need to know for biology, but we're also going to look at one more called Volvox. And you'll notice that Volvox, you can see little purple specks in that slide because Volvox is a multicellular protist, whereas most protists are going to be unicellular. So Volvox is a little bit bigger. So I'm going to put each one of these slides under the microscope by putting the slide on the stage. Um, making sure that I put the slide under the stage clips. And then we're going to focus in the same way that we did before. We start on our lowest power. We have the objective far away from the stage. As we look through the eyepiece of the microscope, we're going to use the course knob to lower that objective toward the stage until we see detail on what's on the slide. And of course, once we get that detail, we switch to the next highest power and make sure that you center the organism that you wanna look at before you switch powers. Um, once you get to the medium power, we're gonna use the fine focus to toggle back and forth to get different um, amounts of detail. And then once you're satisfied with that, you can go to the high power and again, use your fine focus to toggle back and forth to see different levels or um, different, um, um, layers of the organism or to just to see better detail. So let's go put these under the microscope. So now let's look at the protists that we were able to see. We started with our amoeba and this is our amoeba on low power. They have all of these unique and crazy shapes. As we increase the power of magnification, you can see more detail. And once we're on the highest level of magnification that we have, which is 430 times, you're able to see the nucleus really well. And these extensions of the cytoplasm, and these are called pseudopods. And that's how an amoeba is going to move. It stretches out this pseudopod and latches onto a surface. And then um, the other side of the amoeba is going to let go of whatever it's holding onto. And it's going to push its cytoplasm toward that um, pseudopod. And pseudopods are also able to engulf food for the protist. These are paramecium on low power. And if we increase the power of magnification, they're gonna get bigger. And once we get on high power, you can see this nucleus in the cell. You can also see this fuzzy outline of um, the paramecium and that indicates the cilia that are present on the outside of the paramecium. And these cilia are tiny little hairs that are going to allow the paramecium to swim through its environment. And they can also sweep food into the gullet of the paramecium, which is kind of like the mouth for the paramecium. So if we look at the euglena on low power, you see that they appear red, but euglena are really green. Um, these euglena lost their chlorophyll during the preservation process. So they have a pink color, but keep in mind euglena are photosynthetic. And so they are usually going to be green. As we increase our level of magnification, we see these euglena get bigger and bigger, but they are the smallest protists that we're looking at. You can see that they have a nucleus. And what you can't see is that on this non-pointy end, they do have a flagella. And that flagella is a long tail that spins like a propeller and helps these euglena to swim through their environment. We also looked at Volvox, which is our only multicellular protist. And this is the Volvox on low power. As we increase power, you can see more and more detail. So this is high power and each one of these little purple dots here is an individual cell and they all work together to make this colony. Now these dark spots that you see inside are not nuclei because this is not an individual cell. These are more colonies of um, Volvox that are going to mature inside of that organism and then break free to go forth and start their own colony. 
So far, all of the cells that we've looked at under the microscope have belonged to domain eukarya, which means all of these cells have a common characteristic. They have a nucleus and other organelles within their cell membrane. So we have four kingdoms of eukarya, and we have looked at three of those kingdoms. The only one we haven't looked at is fungi, but we have looked at plant cells with our onion and our elodea, and we noticed that plants are always multicellular. We have compared those plant cells to animal cells by looking at our own cheek cells, and we know that we are also multicellular. We got lots of cells out of the inside of our mouth. And so we've also looked at the kingdom protista, and protists are eukaryotes that do not fit into the other three kingdoms. They might have characteristics that might place them in both. And so they are given their own kingdom of protista. And those organisms can be unicellular, like we saw with our euglena, our paramecium, and our amoeba, or you can have multicellular uh, protists like our volvox. So now we are going to see if we can find some living protists in this tank of water that's been sitting here over the weekend. So it's got a little bit of um, um, slimy stuff that looks like it's growing on the top. So I definitely want to get some of that slimy stuff in my pipette. And I want to go around at the bottom and get a little bit of what I see growing at the bottom and maybe even in these rocks. So I'm going to just try to get a little bit of water from all over. And I'm going to use um, a slide to make a wet mount of what I'm looking at. And I might make two or three wet mount slides to see if I can find some different living organisms moving around um, under my microscope. So I'm just going to take my liquid this time, which has the specimen in it. And I'm going to take my cover slip and place it on at an angle. And I'm going to put this under my microscope. I'm going to draw off the top a little bit and I'll take some videos and pictures of what I'm able to find and we'll talk about those in your lab. Here you're able to see some of the protists that we found in the aquarium um, under medium power. I don't know what all of these are, but we have here an example of a paramecium. Uh, we looks like we have another example of a euglena here. Um, so we'll look at these on higher powers as well. So here are some of the creatures that you were able to see under the microscope. These very teeny tiny organisms are bacteria. They do not have a nucleus inside of them. You can see there's no spot in there. Um, but all of these other organisms are larger and they are eukaryotic, so they do have a nucleus. And you can see one of those nuclei right here in this cell. This is an example of a nematode that I was able to find and you can see it moving around and munching on some of this algae and that you can actually watch those uh, food particles pass through the intestines of this uh, nematode or tiny little worm. So we have a few post lab questions here. What is a protus? And keep in mind that protus are eukaryotes. They have a nucleus, but these organisms do not fall into the other three kingdoms of eukarya. They may have characteristics that might put them in one or more groups. So they get their own group called protista. The structures that these protists are going to use to move, the amoeba use the pseudopods, the extensions of those uh, cytoplasms. The euglena used a flagella, which is the long tail that helps it to swim. And the paramecium uses cilia, which allows it to swim through its environment. And these are short hairs and there's lots of them on the outside of a cell. Paramecium and amoeba can also use their movement structures, their pseudopods and their cilia in order to get food. The only multicellular protist that we looked at was uh, Volvox, but keep in mind that when we looked at the protist videos, that all of these little organisms moving around under your slide were in a single drop of water. So you can imagine how many of these single celled organisms are going to be in a pond. And if you drink pond water, then you are probably going to be drinking some of these protists and these protists can then set up infections in your body. Um, that can be quite dangerous, like Giardia, for example. Make sure you fill out the pre and post lab questions for your lab and submit that to Canvas so that you get credit for this assignment.